the offering he won. My life, my time, my resources. That's what God wants. That's the offering we are supposed to be given. But that's not what we're given. We're putting a dollar in the plate or a dollar in the box or, or whatever it is. And I never even thought about it before, but now it's funny that I think about it. We pass the plate around and say it's time to take up the offering. And you know what we do when we do that? We give people an opportunity to justify themselves. I gave my offering to God. That's not what he's looking for. That's not what he wants. That's not what he desires. He wants your heart. Amen. He wants you. And if you truly offer yourself to God, then everything that he has blessed you with goes along with that. So he don't need you to put that dollar in and think you've done the offering. If you give this offering, that includes everything else. But we are not doing that. The church is not doing that. And I know I, I repeat myself a lot, and these same themes keep coming up, but I think they're important, and God keeps putting them on my mind. It's not about what we can get from God. It's about what we can give to God. Sure. And we've got that turned around, and we've got that backwards. The only thing that we should be pushing out there, that, that should be our cry that they can get from God is salvation. Not money. Not houses, not land, not comfy jobs and all this and other that. Salvation, eternal life, escape from hell. That's what they can get from God that's worth getting. They can get all these other things, but it's all going to pass away. It's all going to burn. It's all going to be destroyed. And so what good is it? And not burn incense, nor offer burnt offerings in the holy place under the God of Israel. Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem. Again, same thing's been coming up. God wouldn't do that. The wrath of God was on them for doing exactly what the church is doing today. The wrath of God was on them. You hear what the word says. Mm -hmm. But the church today is saying, nah, God's a really nice guy. And if you just be kind and good and generous and, and accept Everybody for what they are and who they are and don't be mean to nobody within your heart. Like, that's not what this says. They brought that filth into the church. They brought that filth into the temple. And because they brought it into the temple, the wrath of God was on them. And I'm going to tell you something. In this country today, they're bringing some dirty, rotten, stinking stuff into the church. They're allowing uh, homosexuality in the church. They got homosexuals standing behind pulpit. They'll accept anybody in any old kind of way. And they'll make excuses for it and for this and for that. And I'm telling you, according to the word of God, God will not tolerate. And the wrath of God will be dumped out. Well, they've been saying that for years. Well, you've just been fortunate that it ain't happened yet. You may still have a chance to escape it. And they're just hollering and hollering and hollering. God won't do that. One of these days, they're going to find out God will do that. And God is going to do that. And we need to tell them that. And yeah, they're going to call you name, and they're going to call you bigot, and they're going to call you intolerant, and they're going to call you a hater. That, that's what they call him. And you know what he said? If they hated me, they're going to hate you. And you can take this however you want. If somebody don't hate you, you might should examine yourself. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's right. If everybody loves you, you might want to examine yourself. <laughs> because I didn't say it. Christ said they hated me. And they're going to hate you. If we are Christ-like, the world ain't going to love us. The world ain't going to like us. The world is going to hate us. And if that ain't happening, we might want to check. Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he hath delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, and to hissing, as you see with your eyes. I'm not going to go into it, but you can go and see what happened to them. What happened to Israel? What happened to Judah? How many times were they overrun by foreign countries? How many times were they taken captive? How many times were they punished? How many of them had to die because they kept bringing the filth into the house of God? They kept bringing it in to the temple of God. They kept turning their backs on God and making their own God exactly what the church is doing today. And God does not change. He didn't put up with it from them. He ain't going to put up with it from 
from us. And I'm going to tell you, right. we have been blessed that it ain't happened yet. I'm going to tell you the truth. I truly believe, I was convinced that when they made that gay marriage stuff law, it was going to happen then. But God has been merciful. God has been long-suffering. But his mercy and his patience are going to run out. That's right. We have done just about everything that we read about in here. God, whole nations wiped out. And God has still been merciful to us. It can't last much longer until God dumps out his wrath. It just can't. According to this word, it can't. We, the church need to realize this and sound the alarm. I have set thee a watchman on the wall to sound the trumpet. That's us, church. That's us. Every individual Christian, every child of God, you are a watchman. You are to warn them that the wrath is coming. But we don't do that. You know what? We as individual Christians don't do it because the church never taught us that. The church has been uh, so far gone for so long, we were never taught all that stuff. You know, we were brought up believing. That's talking about preachers. Hollering at the congregation. Come on. That's what we were taught. That's right. That's not what it is. We are that voice. We are that trumpet. We are that one who is to sound the alarm, to sound the warning. And he didn't say in the broom closet. He said you're standing on the wall with a trumpet so that sound carries, so everybody hears it. That's our job. That's what we're supposed to do. But we've allowed the temple to be defiled. We've allowed the church to be defiled. It's time to do what they did here and clean it out. Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he hath delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, and to hissing, as you see with your eyes. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword. Our sons and our daughters, our wives, are in captivity for this. How many of your family are lost. Come on. Let's just put it real plain and real simple. And I'm not talking about your family. I'm talking about mine. How many of them are heathens? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How many of them are just downright ungodly? Mm -hmm. How many of them don't even care to hear a word about God? How many of them become downright hateful when you try to talk to them about God? Our sons, our daughters, our friends, our families are in captivity. They are bound by Satan. That's right. Why? Because we allow the temple to get filthy. We allow the church to become defiled. We allow all that to happen. And this is the end result. Our fathers have fallen by the sword. Our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Because we allowed it to happen. We allowed the temple to become what the temple has become. Yeah, Christianity today, and people who say they are Christian, they're a walking, defiled temple. They're allowing anything. They're accepting anything. And they're letting it go on. And the things around this country that call themselves the house of God may be the house of some God, but they are not the house of the God. And we've allowed that. Sure. Well, what could we have done about it? Everything. We've got the ultimate power on our side. We've got the authority. We've been given. You know the scripture. We're more than conquerors. We are mighty to the tearing down of strongholds. We can tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy if we would. But we have chosen to be like a bunch of scared little rabbits coming into our hole and shutting the door and keeping it all in here. It ain't doing anybody a bit of good for me to stand in here and tell you what's wrong out there. That don't do them nothing. They need to hear it. He said all these things 
They began to repair the house of God and clean it up. They had to sanctify themselves. Then they had to sanctify the house of God. And he goes on to say the reason this has to be done is because our forefathers, those who came before us, began to forsake God and turn away from God. And they began to bring in ungodly things into the house of God and into the temple and allow all this stuff to go on. And because all this has gone on, God's wrath has delivered them over uh, to give them. I'll tell you what, he gives you what you want. And he gave them what what they want, what they ask for. That's what he's doing to the church today. And he said, because of all these things, our fathers, our sons and our daughters, our wives, our loved ones have been taken captive. They are held tight by Satan. I'm going to tell you something. Satan has such a grip on this world today that it is going to take a mighty, mighty child of God to break that grip. Somebody who's connected, somebody who understands what it is that they can do through Christ. It's going to take somebody like that. It ain't going to take your lukewarm, wishy-washy Christian who's just going to walk up to people and say, well, you know, Jesus loves you. That ain't going to work. We have to take authority. We have to understand we have the power. You know what? And I've heard that stuff. To homosexual, uh, to drug addicts, to this one and to that one. Well, Jesus loves you anyway. He does. You need to be going on that. You know how much he loves you? He loves you enough to die for you, to shed his blood for you. And now you can have that blood applied because that's the only thing that's going to enable you to escape hell. The church has just walked away from what the church is supposed to be. Now all these people are in captivity for it. But listen what Hezekiah goes on here and says. But now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his spirit's wrath may turn away from us. Some Christians need to get that in their heart. Some Christians need to say, now it's in my heart. I want to make this covenant with God. I want to be the one who will begin to clean this stuff up, who will begin to put this stuff out, who will begin to take the garbage to the curb where it belongs and get it out of the house of God. When Hezekiah decided, it's my heart to make a covenant with God, when he made that covenant with God, he began to do some things. He began to clean up the temple. He began to get the garbage out. He began to say to these guys, you need to be sanctified. You need to set yourself apart. You need to clean up this house. That's what the church needs to begin to do. That's what the children of God need to begin to do. We need to make that covenant. Now it's in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel. That his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, listen. This I really want you to get. And I'm going to say this to you. And I believe I can say this to you. Because the Spirit is telling me to say this. This is to you. Listen. My sons, be not now negligent. For the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him. To serve him. And that ye should minister unto him and burn incense. Listen, those of you sitting here. He has chosen you. To stand before him. To minister. To burn the incense. How can I say that? I said it this morning and you know where I'm going. You have not chosen me. I have chosen you. And listen, what did he say? He has chosen you to stand before him. Why did he choose you? For this very reason. To proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. To call sin, sin. To, to uh, attack Satan. And listen. Everybody knows that scripture. Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm going to tell you some gates are defensive, not offensive. We wait for him to come at us. If we're attacking the gates, we're going at him. Because the gates protect him. Gates don't come running after you and attack you. We're supposed to be attacking hell, not waiting for hell to attack us. We're supposed to be going out there and going after him. But we sit and we wait for him to come after us. That's when we have a problem. When Satan starts troubling us. When he starts bothering us. When he starts getting on us. That's when we start to stand up a little bit. It ain't supposed to be that way. We are not to even give him an opportunity. We are to be putting him on the run and chasing after him. And have him the one who's got to worry about us. 
you ever hear that? I might not say it right. There's a little saying. I want to be the kind of Christian that when my feet hit the floor in the morning, Satan starts to shake. That's what we are to desire. That's what we are to want. Just think about this. Wouldn't it be awesome that you know when you get up in the morning, Satan's going, oh no. Here they come again. You can be that kind of a Christian. You can have that kind of power. This book will tell you just exactly how to do it. We need to make that covenant. We need to do this. Be not negligent for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that you should minister unto him and burn incense. You are chosen. I, I told you the scripture. Jesus said, I have chosen you. What did Peter say? You are a chosen generation. We are chosen. God pulled us out of the world and prepared us to be soldiers for him, to go out there and to fight this battle. Not to sit in our little rabbit holes. But the reason the church isn't doing it is because the church has been defiled. The church has been led to believe that if we just come every Sunday and do our little church thing and be the nice people and do all, you know all the stuff. If we just do that, we're all right. That's not what we were called to. This is what we were called to. And it's got to start by cleaning out the house. This house. Then this house. Jump over to verse 17 of that chapter. I stop there. What happens after this is as the Levites arose and it gives a whole list of their names. I mean, verse 15 of that chapter, not 17, sorry. It gives all their names and then it says, and they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. After the king told them all this stuff, that this is what you need to do, what did they do? They did it. When God speaks, we need to move. God is speaking. God is saying, we need to clean ourselves up. We need to clean up the church. We, now we need to move. This is what they did. They didn't hesitate. They didn't wait. But uh, you know what I'm going to say. They didn't pray about it. They didn't put out a fleece. They didn't fast about it. They did it. The longer you put something off, the less likely you are to do it. When they heard, they moved. They began to do it. They gathered their brethren. They sanctified themselves. And they came according to the commandment by the word of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. And the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it to carry it out abroad into the book of Kidron. Listen, they went into the house of the Lord and they brought out all the filth. They kicked the world out. And that's what we need to do. We need to keep any of the worldly stuff out of the house of God and out of our own lives. They began on the first day of the first month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord, so they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days, and in the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. Then they went to Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord and the altar of burnt offering with all the vessels thereof and all the showbread, <coughs> table and all the vessels thereof. Moreover, all the vessels which King Ahaz in his reign did cast away in his transgression have we prepared and sanctified, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. Listen, there's been a lot of stuff that the church has cast away. There was a lot of stuff here that they said King Ahaz had cast away, but they brought it back. They renewed it. We need to renew the church. We need to bring back the old past, the old landmarks, the old Amen. ways. Amen. We need to get back to the way God set it up and restore these old things and put them back into operation. We need to get the dirt out, sanctify all the vessels. What are the vessels? We are the vessels and the things God has given us to use. He gave them those vessels in there. They all represented something. I ain't got time to go into all of it, but you go study what they represented. Those things represent the same thing in you. The things that God has equipped you with and given you to use. And we need to begin to start to use them again. We need to restore the house of God to what the house of God was intended to be and get all this junk out. And again, I'm not saying that it's happening here, and I'm not saying that it's going on here, but I'm going to tell you, if we ain't careful to some degree or another, it's going on here. Mm -hmm. sure. Whatever goes on here...